Hello, 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 hello. Happy Juneteenth weekend. If you're new here, hello, hello, hello. Welcome. My name is Aja. Hey, fun people. I am so excited to get on here and really talk about a topic that seems so heavy and it could be looked at as controversial, but it's really not. In efforts to celebrate Juneteenth, you see so many celebrations and so many things going on. Good things, good things, good things, of course. But I definitely wanted to get on here and talk about something that's very serious and get you to literally open your eyes to a topic that is so heavy upon us and we might not, not even realize that it's hurting our culture, it's hurting um, African-American children. And I really want to get on here and talk about how to teach Black kids to read. I want to give you five really amazing tips so that you can teach any child that is African-American exactly how to read. I'm doing this once again. It is Juneteenth. Happy Juneteenth weekend. As we celebrate Juneteenth, I also want to talk about how to get children reading of the African-American race. Hello, hello, hello. Hey, Tangela. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm so excited that you are here on today. All right, so let's just, before we dive in, let's go over some very important facts that you might or might not know. The first fact is there was a recent study done um, last year, actually, and it showed that 71.7% of African American elementary students scored below proficiency in reading. It used to be 52. Now, you know, it is few years later, it is now 71% of African-American children. And the really sad thing about that is when you compare that to children of other races, um, only 39.1% of white students scored proficient in reading. So what does that mean? That mean, I mean, below, I'm sorry, 39.1% of white students scored below proficient in reading. What does that mean? That literally shows, looking at the data, that there is about a 40% gap between white children and African-American children when it comes to reading. Y'all, that is a huge gap. Like, whoo, 31 versus 71%. Like, so... I I literally was like fabricated when I saw that fact and I wanted to know what are your thoughts why do you think this is why do you think there is a 40% gap between white children and black children reading on a grade level. You said exactly, exactly, yes. And that fact just blew my mind. So I wanted to know what were some of the things that you guys thought about as far as why this is? Why do you think um, there's such a big gap? You said a huge gap, yeah. <laughs> 40% that, I knew it was a gap. I've always known it was a gap. And I feel like the gap is actually getting wider as time gets on. It's not getting, you know, narrower. We're trying to, you know, close the gap. But it seems like we're getting further and further from our target. Um, and then another fact really blew my mind. Let me know in the chat box, do you have or do you teach an African-American male? Do you have an African-American male as a child or do you? Do you teach them in the classroom? Because this next fact may be surprising, might not be surprising to some, but definitely worth us talking about. Um, so another fun fact is that 12% of Black fourth grade boys and another 12% of eighth grade fourth grade fourth, I mean, eighth grade African-American boys actually score proficient in reading and math. That means only 12%, 12% of African-American males are reading on grade level. 12%, y'all, like we're just now hitting double digits. 12% of them actually read on grade level. And that's the same with fourth graders and eighth graders. The same study was done in both fourth grade and eighth grade boys. And both studies showed that only 12% of that population was actually reading on grade level. So this just like blew my mind. You said not good. Absolutely. Like, and you say you do, you, yep, you have a son. So you have a son who is an African-American male that you homeschool. And now like you see what he is up against. And it's not just him. These are, these are facts. I mean, 
I didn't come up with this. My numbers would not look like this. But uh, because this, I, this is crazy. Um, he said, we have to help our parents help more. Yes. I think, I think that's when we I was asking, you know, what are your thoughts? Why do you fights feel like it is such a, a such a big gap? And I, I absolutely agree that if, uh, you say, yes, yes, yes. If parents understood these facts, they understood what their children are up against and they would have a more of a um, active role in their young African-American males education. And I saw another fact and it made me think, okay, so I wonder if it's like a, you know, cause and effect. And um, the second fact was that 20% um, the African-Americans males that are behind grade level in fourth grade. So we just read that only 12% of African-American males are actually on grade level, right? <laughs> so of the rest of them, right, that's 82% of African-American males are not on grade level. Of that, they only have a 20% chance of actually graduating from high school on grade level. What does that mean? That means as they graduate, they cannot read at the grade level um, that they are graduating from. So they cannot read at a 12th grade level. Then that also puts them in jeopardy of not getting the jobs that they want to get, not being able to get the opportunities that they want to tap into. I know there's a huge movement in you know entrepreneurship because um, a lot of us aren't, and I say us because I am an African-American person, but a lot of us aren't you know, going to school or saying, you know, school's not like me or we're competing with other people in the workforce. So we see it as a, you said true, <laughs> we see it on an adult level. You know, have have you guys ever really sat and thought about the, 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 I'm sure y'all have, I'm sure y'all have, but the um, disproportional ratio between, you know, other ethnicities and African-Americans in the workplace, um, especially in the corporate world. And I've never personally worked in the corporate world. Y'all know I've been in education <laughs> ever since I graduated, but there is a big gap. There is a huge gap. And we're seeing that the crazy part is that African-American males that are not reading on grade level in fourth grade only have 20% chance of graduating in high school reading on grade level. So literally a child, an innocent little child, if we look at that little boy right there in the picture, if he is not reading on grade level by the end of elementary, then there's a high possibility that that baby will not be reading on grade level when he graduates high school and i'm just interested in knowing what do you guys think what are your thoughts like have you seen this do you personally have a maybe a child or have you taught a child that was behind in elementary school and then you see where they are when they go to you know high school or college like what are your thoughts have you seen this firsthand are you just whoa flabbergasted at the the research but i'm definitely interested in knowing what are your thoughts? Why do you think this is? What What do you have to say? What's going on in your head? I told y'all we we are really diving into this today. I know it's Saturday, whoop, whoop. but um, in celebration of Juneteenth, I definitely wanted to talk about this. And now I want us to think about, okay, now what? How do we stop this? How do we stop this? We see that it seems like already our children are up against a system that's not designed for them. And yes, I said it. I just, I said it. They're up against a system um, that's not designed to, to help them. So like, how, how do we, what do we do? How do we stop this? How do we um, close in those gaps? Um, you said you're absolutely flabbergasted. I love it. You said um, you see this firsthand. Yeah. So when you see it firsthand, it's like, it makes you just kind of take a step back and think, okay, what can I do to change this? What are some of the things that I can do to um, to stop this? Or what? where does my hand in all of this? Where does my hand fit in history? How can I help? If I can just help one child, whether it be my own child or someone else's child, then how can I actually close the gaps and stop this huge gap between African-American children and other children. And so that's what I want to talk about. I want us to move forward in 
um, not just bringing up the problem, but I also want to give you solutions. I'm a very solution oriented person. So we see the facts. We see that there is literally a 40 percent gap between African-American children and um, white children. And now we see that even with our African-American males that are behind grade level in fourth grade, they only have a 20 percent chance of actually graduating high school reading on grade level. You say happy Juneteenth. Yes, happy Juneteenth. So I want us to go into Juneteenth by me giving you five really fun, um, quick and easy tips for you to teach your African-American children how to read, whether it be your own children in the classroom, whatever it is, these tips can be applied as you go and teach African-American children to read. And I'm just going to bring up a very important fact. And when I think about you know why there's that gap. You it's is you have to bring up how children learn. And naturally, African American children are more active. And I'm not going into the you know a whole bunch of politics, but if you want to think about naturally the African American, just the male, let's just talk about the male. We just went over the facts with African American males. Naturally, if you look in the science, they have more energy than other demographics. That's that's straight up science. And um, a lot of times when they're in schools and they're in these, you know, public school systems, they get in trouble trouble for being who they are. They get in trouble just for being them. They get in trouble. Naturally, they like to rap. They like to tap on the tap on the desk with a pencil. Like they have all this energy and naturally they're just, you're always told and y'all let me know um, if you saw this in school, you're told to just sit down and be quiet and just sit down and stop. Just stop, stop fidgeting. Stop doing that. Stop doing that. And you want, um, you want them to be in a box. And they're expected to be in a box, but it goes against their nature and it goes against who we are as a culture. We're naturally like all over the place, you know, so <laughs> you say, yep, yep, yep. So instead of fighting against it, if we really want to think about how to close that gap and we really want to think, you said, that's your son. Girl, that's going to apply to you in order to really think about, OK, how can I actually close that gap. If I know that African-American children are more active, they naturally have more energy, then let me cater to that. So tip number one is to make reading active. If you know that they're naturally active, we have to make reading match their energy. Don't fight against it. Have you ever tried to swim against the grain or swim against the current or go against the grain? Like, you're, you're, you're fighting five times harder to go nowhere. If they're naturally active, make your lessons active. So tip number one is to definitely make reading active. And how do we do that? How can we make reading active? Well, I thought of two really good points that about that is let them move. If you know that African-American children, naturally, they like to move. They like to get up. They like to do things. We do. Think about us as adults. We like to get up and we like to move. So allow them to move. Find activities and lessons that get kids moving. They don't want to sit down in a, in a desk. Do you guys remember when we were growing up? And I know everybody might be different age group, age, you know, age, um, Ages, but I just remember like the the seats were in different rows, and you were just expected to just sit there, and that's not um, that's not our children. It's not they are they're used to like instant satisfaction, and um, if you think about technology, they're used to just clicking a button and getting what they want, and they're they're so used to being active. Well, tip number one is make learning active. So find activities and allow them to move. A classroom management tip that I thought about was letting you know it's okay for them to move. Pick your battles. Doing okay, doing this and you know fidgeting in the air is not hurting anybody. Yes, it might be annoying if they're doing this, but now if they're doing this, okay, maybe they're distracting other children or other people, but I mean, naturally pick your battle. So let me see y'all's thoughts in the comments. You said you think there is such a gap because of um, economics. Absolutely not enough exposure to literature. Woo! I love that one. And we're going to go over that one. That's actually one of the tips, man. You was on it. Um, and conversations with families more. Yes. And she brought that up earlier. She felt like, um, yeah, she said um, two things. We need to help our, our families. If, if, 
conversation with the families and we need to understand that it is a village. It takes a village to raise a child and it definitely takes a village to raise um, an African-American child. We're not different than any other child, but it takes a village. And a lot of times parents just want to pawn it off to the teacher or they'll say, oh, they'll teach them. They get it. They'll they'll wait, learn that in school. And we can't do that. And I, y'all see me, I'm, look, y'all getting me all ahead up, but uh, yes, 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 I can't, I can't not talk about the fact that, that parents have a role in education. So I definitely agree that the conversations with, conversations with parents, and I know that's one of the main reasons I started this YouTube channel was because I felt like there was, there, there's a role that parents had that they didn't understand that they had. They didn't understand the, the easy tools that they could use to implement and help um, better prepare their child to read and, you know, just to be successful in life. And seeing how these numbers have gone from like 52% of African Americans proficient to um, I mean, sorry, 52% of African-Americans reading below grade level to 71% of African-Americans reading below grade level. I am just like, I mean, it's like there's such a big gap and it's going to take our entire culture to really dive in and close in that gap. Um, and so I definitely, definitely agree with that. You said your son has a hard time sitting down within well, this tip. Girl, it's okay for him to move. You have to think, okay, is what he's doing going to distract the learning of him or others? If it is not going to distract how he learns, because naturally, I mean, you probably don't even know that you're doing something like this all the time. You know, you probably don't even know that naturally you're just like moving and you don't even realize that, you know, you're like naturally fidgeting as an adult. Um, and I know when I teach my daughter, she's like, she always gets up and goes. And like, if I'm sitting there, like she's on the floor and then she'll just start moving all the time. Like, and I have to learn, <coughs> sorry, to pick my battles. This just the Okay, if, if it's not distracting her from the lesson and the content that I'm trying to teach her, then okay. Um, I am one that I, fun fact about me, fun fact in high school, um, and y'all might, don't judge me, don't judge me, don't judge me, don't judge me. But in high school, I was a doodler. I like to color. I still like the color. I like everything to be in color coordinated. But in high school, in order for me to learn, like in science and um, history, I had a little Disney, yes, Disney, coloring book. And I would be coloring in school. And I made straight A's. I was a completely straight A student. Um, but I remember other students were like, well, we want to color. We want to color. And my teacher was like, only Aja, only Aja can color. Like, the rest of y'all, you're okay. And the reason why is he understood that I was a natural fidgeter, but when I was fidgeting or coloring, I was actually paying attention more. And that's how I learned um, what he was saying, because what for me, I would correlate what he was saying with, um, with what I was coloring. And so he learned that it was okay for him to just pick his battles. If I was naturally fidgeting and, and coloring, as long as I was paying attention and it wasn't disturbing the learning of me or others, then it was okay. Now, eventually other students tried to do it and they were trying to bring in their coloring books and schools and stuff. And then he had to stop it and he had a conversation with me. He was like, I know you're paying attention, but now it is distracting other people and he had to stop. So learn how to pick your battles. If it's not distracting them from learning, then allow them to fidget. It's under, we just have to understand the, the mindset that African-American children naturally have more energy and they're naturally, um, they're active. That, that's just, especially the boys. The boys are active. You said you teach a few African-American male second graders. A perfect example. So you might see that they're naturally more energetic they have more energy and instead of like sitting there trying to put them in a box like let's just encourage them and you know to to use that energy and just kind of channel it into learning and into reading oh so that brings us up to our tip number two and the second tip i have for you is to close in the gaps in order to really teach african-american children and really be able to go in and close in this 40 percent um deficit between African-American children and, and non-African-American children, we have to learn how to close in the gap. And the, unfortunately, because they're they're reading below grade level, that means that there are gaps that they have. And whether they're in preschool or in eighth grade, there are some gaps, there's some learning gaps that they have if they're not reading on grade level. So 
two really good tips is the first one is phonics. So when it comes to not reading on grade level, nine times out of 10, that means that there is a phonics deficit. They do not understand the correlation between letters and sounds. And if they do not understand how to correlate lessons and I mean, sorry, sounds and letters. I don't know why I said lessons and sounds, but letters and sounds. There we go. But if they can't learn how to correlate letters and sounds, then they won't be able to um, be able to read a word. And if they're not being able to read a word, what our children are doing, they're just guessing. They're just guessing and they're guessing and guessing and guessing and guessing. And as we're passing them from one grade level to the next, to the next, to the next. And then next thing you know, just like the research showed us that we're trying to graduate children that are behind grade levels. And then they're not able to get into the job and the workforce that they want. So in order to close that gap, I want you to assess what they know, assess, um, assess their phonics, even if they're in eighth grade, if they're in eighth grade and they're reading on a third grade or fifth grade level, Level, that means that there's some phonics deficit. So the first thing you're going to want to do is assess. You have to figure out what they know, right? So once you figure out what they know, then you know what they don't know. And then you can reteach the skills that are missing. And you can just kind of teach the skills that are missing. So assess what they know, and then it teach the missing skills. Um, and then the next thing you can do in order to close the gap is to teach them strategies. I say this all the time to my students. And it's one of the reasons that all of my EIP students were able to come great levels above in one year. That's just kind of what I'm known for. Um, not trying to brag or anything whatsoever, but um, that is one of the reasons that I went from the classroom to an administrator so fast in my career is because of the data that I, you know, I had with my students. But one thing that I used to always teach my students in was in reading was to use what you know and fill in what you don't know. And I used to say to them, use what you know to get you to go where you want to go. Use what you know to get you where you want to go. Oh, you say you better brag. I'm not a bragger at all. I'm not. But at, after a while, I had to realize like who I was and, um, you know, your strengths. I feel like you don't realize your strengths enough. But I realized that that was my strength. My strength is getting children to close in those gaps. So I'm sharing, I'm sharing a bit with you. I'm sharing y'all because it takes a village. It takes all of us to be able to close these gaps. So teach them strategies. They're not, they're not going to come. They're not going to know every single word they come up to. Do you know every single word you read? Or did you know? I know when I was a child, I was a struggling reader. Do I have anybody else in the chat box that was also a struggling reader growing up? Because that was me. I was a struggling reader, but I'm also telling you that I graduated with straight A's. I'm also telling you I have three degrees, but I was a struggling reader. Hello, because I learned for myself, I, I was kind of a self-taught, I taught myself, but I learned how to use what I knew already to kind of fill in those gaps. You say your teaching comes easy. <laughs> yes, I love um, Yeah, so yeah, to me, teaching just is second nature, it's second nature. Um, but anybody can learn, anybody can learn. So the third tip in that um, in order for African-American children to learn how to read is you want to set them up for success. And you can do that through providing them with a print rich environment. Um, and let me know if you've never heard that term. We can, we're going to dive into it. But a print rich environment is so crucial to getting children to fall in love with fall in love with learning, fall in love with literacy. You see, the thing is, and I mean, that's. I hate bringing up these facts, but they're true facts. That's why we started this live off with the facts. The truth of the matter is, and you got to put yourself in that situation. If you are a child who is reading below grade level, then naturally you're going to constantly get frustrated every single time you read a book or you're in school or or whatnot, you know, and if a child is getting frustrated every time they see a word, then they're going to naturally develop feelings and those feelings won't be positive, but they'll be negative. So naturally they'll start to hate reading. Do I have anybody that used to hate reading and you don't want children to 
absolutely cringe and hate reading. So in order to promote reading, you want to have an environment that gets children excited about words and excited about literature so that they can dive in and know that it's okay. It's okay not to know every word. It's okay to, to like words. It's okay to read, you know? And so you want to promote that type of environment, especially at a younger age. You say, you're so right. It takes a village. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So in order to have a print rich environment, and I know um, you said it earlier, yes, you said exposure to literature. You feel like African American students don't have enough exposure to literature, but here we go. This is this is where it comes in. That we have to have um, and give them a library of books. You see, so the sad thing about it is crazy. I was just talking to my brother because he has a little baby now, um, is that a lot of households and a lot of classrooms of children, of African-American children do not have um, enough books or they do not understand the importance of having books in their environment. And you see, in order to really close in this gap and teach African-American children, you have to get their buy-in. They have to want to read. Um, so you want to have a library of books. Having one book is a start, but over time, you want to start collecting books. And then I'm going to give you another tip. You want to put those books in one place. Um, and if you have a lot, multiple places. I actually did an entire YouTube video all about how to have a print rich environment, both in the classroom and at home. And in that video, I shared how like even in my home and in the classroom, how you have multiple sections of your environment with books. And for my house, I have books and like we have a little library in my car, a library near her, like it's in the hallway. Yes, I have a bookshelf in the hallway. Don't judge me. But we have a bookshelf in the hallway so that she can kind of get it when she's upstairs. We have a um, another bookshelf downstairs, so downstairs and upstairs. And she has books by her bathroom, bathtub. So she kind of has books everywhere. When I was in the classroom, I had my reading center, of course. Then I have books. I had books of the week because <laughs> we used to do like an author of the week. So I would do like books of the week and they would be um on my board. And then I had math books in the math section, science and social studies books in that section as well. And then of course, guided reading books when they came to uh, my small group table. So even in the classroom, I had multiple sections of books. So you want to have a collection of books and kind of spread those books throughout your house or throughout your classroom. Um, you said this. Yes, you said, I saw um, a statistic that states how Black students don't have even 25 books in a home. I believe it. I believe it. And that is sad. And look, you said it takes a village. That is sad. Like we have, I don't think us as um, people, the culture, the African-American culture, we don't understand the importance of just having access to multiple books. And even as you see, one of the one of the facts is you want to have books that are fiction and nonfiction. They have to get used to both type of text. And if we don't expose our children to those both those type of texts, you, you know, even at home, then when they go in the classroom or they take a state standardized test, they're in culture shock. Like literally, they're in culture shock because they do not understand how to read it because they don't understand like text features. And if they only see text features on a test, then how do we expect them to be able to read a manual? You get what I'm saying? So I definitely believe that fact. And I mean, I, it's sad. It is so, so sad that that is a fact, but I totally believe it. Like I said, I was talking to my brother about this yesterday and he was showing me the books that he has for his daughter. And even he was excited. He had about like 10 books and that was a lot to him. He was like, I have a whole library. And um, so I was excited that, you know, he was getting excited, but it's true. So I, I believe that, um, I believe that and it's sad. And I don't think we, we put enough. And I know whenever I'm working with my clients in my teaching by design program, I'm always talking about, you have to have a variety of a library of books. And then I teach them how to use those books in order to teach, um, teach different skills and teach different strategies. You said they have so much energy. Yep. We have all this energy to do everything else. We need to put that energy and channel that energy into reading. Another thing about a print rich environment is a print rich environment is going to have signs and it's going to have posters. Um, so I want you to think about whether, you know, you're a homeschool parent y'all let me know, are you homeschool or a teacher in the chat box? And also, where are you from? Yes, I forgot to ask that. So homeschool 
or teacher and where are you from? So when I say homeschool, that also could be a working parent. So let me know which one are you, teacher or parent? Yeah, teacher or parent. And where are you guys located? Um, so you want to, I want to ask you to think about like, what is on your wall? What's on the walls? Do you, if you're teaching in a completely blank environment, I'm here to tell you that naturally when you go to read, they're checked out because they don't have, um, their, their brain isn't being stimulated by their environment. So you definitely want to have, you know, signs and posters in addition to the library of books. So let's jump into tip number four. And tip number four is you want to teach skills early. And we kind of dived into this a little bit earlier, but it's important that we teach skills early. And we talked about the village and we talked about the importance of not only the teacher, but also the parent. And it's important that we understand to teach skills early. Have you guys ever heard of a person saying, I'm going to wait until... I'm not, what, what are you going to wait until, or I'm not going to start, you know, reading to them until, or I'm not going to teach letters until, or I'm not going to do this until. And I'm like, what are you waiting for? Did you know that babies actually start to learn words when they're in their womb? I actually, one of my first, my very, very first YouTube video was on how to get a child to talk and children learn words when they're in the womb. So why are we waiting in order to read to them or in order to teach them how to read? What are we waiting for? Um, you said former disciplinarian homeschooling. Hey, hey. Um, you said facts, facts, substitute from Atlanta, ATL, ATL. So I'm so glad you guys are on here with me to celebrate Juneteenth on a Saturday. Um, and to talk about such a um such an important topic. Um, so let's dive in um even more. You said that's awesome. Thank you for helping us learn. I want to close the gaps. Yes, especially teaching, teaching second grade. You get them while they are um sponges <laughs> that's a very crucial age is that second grade they are sponges and what you teach them can really really help them so we appreciate all that you do you said you read with your kids while you were pregnant yes yes so you gotta think about it. if kids are soaking in words and they're soaking in the language then then what are we waiting for we cannot wait. So um, teach letters and sounds. And you can do this as early as one or two. You guys, you know, like parents, you know your children. Um, with my daughter, I started teaching her at one and a half. That's when we started going over letters and sounds. About when, the, when you know, when she was able to start talking um, is when we started going over that. So you know your child, you know about kind of when. And um, the other thing is look at readiness skills. And I have readiness skills checklist for every single grade level. I actually have the link down below in the description. If you click the little description under this video, you will see the readiness skills checklist. And what that is, is um, those are the skills. I have kindergarten through fifth grade. But those are the skills that a child must master in order to be ready to receive the upcoming grade level standard. Standards. So in order to know if a child is ready, let's say, you know, you're teaching first grade. So, I mean, second grade or you're, you're homeschooling, you're teaching a grade. And during the summer right now, we are in the middle of, of summer, Woo, summer vacation. But in order to know if a child is ready for the upcoming grade, you want to assess their understanding and their readiness of another skill. You said, thank you. Thank you. Yep. Girl, get, get you your checklist. It's free. Completely free, free readiness skills checklist. Link is down below in the description. So what? Uh, teach them skills early. You know, um, don't wait. What are we waiting on? There's, there's nothing to wait for. In fact, every moment we wait is a moment that they're getting even further behind. And that's a moment where the gap is e widening even more. Um, so the, the, there's nothing to wait for. Uh, I don't know if y'all are waiting on permission. I don't know who told you you need to wait on permission. Take Take me as your educational expert. Do not wait. Do not wait. Do not wait. And that brings us to the next point is you have the power to become the expert. So you can become the expert. And as you become the expert in teaching your African-American child or African-American children in the classroom, then then only then they will be able to succeed. So how can you become an expert? And that's the most 
crucial thing I want you to walk away with from here is um, you can connect with the professional. I am an educational consultant. I would love to be your professional that will help you teach your children, um, but connect, connect with professional and really follow them. Soak it in, so, soak up as much as you can in order to learn anything. You, oh, we all have to learn. Everything's a learning curve, but I truly believe that it takes a village and each and every one of us, whether you're a grandparent or, um, an administrator or a para, whatever it is, we all have a role in shaping the future. Um, and if you look at some of my old videos, I was always talking about shaping the future, but that's that's what I believe in my heart. And that's what I feel like is my, um, my calling and mission. Like I get so excited when I talk about teaching the youth and teaching the upcoming generations. But connect with an expert. I would love to be an expert. Uh, you say, yes. <laughs> um, but also soak up as much professional development as possible. And if you've never heard the term professional development, that is simply a training, like trainings, reading trainings, um, but just understanding reading best practices. And if you can uh, um, go to these trainings and learn about reading best practices, I have plenty of professional development videos here on YouTube. You want to teach God at reading? There's a whole playlist. You want to learn how to do read aloud? There's a whole playlist. Like, like really dive in and soak in and take the time to become the expert. You do not have to pawn your child or just wait till another teacher or someone else comes in and closes those gaps. You can do it. I promise you, you can do it. You have what it takes. Each and every person can become an expert. All you have to do is try. <laughs> all you have to do is try. And in order for, I, I'm not saying all this, but I want to definitely teach you. I would love to invite you to my upcoming workshop. Go and come to this workshop so that you can become the expert, so that you know what you're doing to teach your African-American child or children, so that you have the confidence when it comes to teaching reading. Do I have anybody that lacks confidence in, in teaching reading? I definitely encourage you to come to my upcoming workshop reading workshop is the three secrets to teaching reading with ease. Not only will I show you how to teach reading, with, um, but I'll also show you how to do it effectively because uh, you said you can't wait. Woo, 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 woo. Yes, um, I think you already signed up. Um, but there's, there's, there's two parts of this. I see the overwhelm that so many of us face when it comes to teaching or, or the, the, the biggest roadblock is that teaching, especially when you come comes to teaching reading, becomes so overwhelming. And that seems like that's the word that I always hear time and time again. And I don't want it to be overwhelming because what ends up happening is something is too overwhelming to us. Naturally, we quit. I mean, we're humans, right? Naturally, you quit. And I do not want you to quit. But there's so much at stake here. There's, there's a child or children that are waiting on you to become the expert. And I don't want you to get burned out. And I don't want you to quit because you have somebody that is counting on you. So come join me next Tuesday um, as we talk about the three secrets of teaching reading with ease. And I'm going to go over what everyone gets wrong about teaching reading and what you should do instead. So we'll go over the three biggest mistakes with that. We will also go over the game-changing mind shift that you have when it comes to making your reading instruction run on autopilot. So I'll definitely show you how to view reading. And a lot of times when it comes to teaching reading, we have the wrong perception of reading. We think it's this huge mountain because it's a fact reading has so many different pieces to it. It's like this big old puzzle and there's so many different parts and different pieces, but I will show you how to change your mind so that you can see reading as a simple tool in order to get a child to be successful. And you can do that through getting them to to learn, you know, reading and learn how to read on autopilot. You'll also learn how to reimagine what's possible um, possible, I'm sorry, what, uh, how to reimagine what's possible and come up with a system that is fun and simple. We talked about one of the tips. Tip number one is to make reading active. We just learned that African-American children naturally have more energy. And instead of putting all that energy in the box, I told you to make reading um, exciting and make it active. So make sure you 
come to the workshop because I'll be showing you just how to do that and making it active is making it fun and also simple for you. And last but not least, I'll show you the one step that you can immediately implement to achieve high growth while you work less. Can you believe that? Kids kids learn more while you work less. Yes, I see the hands up. You said yes in the chat box. So if you are ready to work smarter, not harder, and you have a heart of helping your African-American children, then make sure that you join um, Join me next Tuesday. I cannot wait to, to sit here and and be able to educate you even further. The link to the workshop is in the description and also in the chat box. You'll see it pinned at the very top. So make sure you click that sign up. For those of you guys, it sounds like you guys are already signed up. I can't wait till you join me. You say you're an African-American teacher and a parent of an autistic daughter. Woo! So you you see it from both both ends. You see it. I, I love that. Um, I love it. I love it. I, I know there I've worked with another another one of my clients who had um, a child with a dis disability. And we talked about like really you, you can't put them in the back, especially if they're autistic or, you know, they have a lot of energy and or they're dealing with a disability. Use that and find activities that they can do and they get excited to do. Because I'm here to tell you, if you have ever seen and I hope you have that smile, just that that super smile on a child's face. Are you from New York? What part of New York? I used to live in Long Island when when. Look, when and I know you were on the uh, live the other day, and I said I, when I was in first grade, <laughs> but I, I can still claim it. I can still claim it. you said you read a lot too. Good, 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 good. Yes, reading becomes such a huge part of um, of language, and if children you children don't get the opportunity to listen to books and be read to, then it's really hard for them to really be able to comprehend new words and learn new words as well. Um, so I'm dying to know. Um, also, 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 for those of you guys, um, you said your kids, your kids' teacher uses pictures and words for your child with autism. So yes, we have two two parents of two autistic children, and that's one strategy right there: pictures and words. And yes, yes, yes. Um, so definitely, you got to use you know use skills and use strategies that work. Every child can read and every child um, has their own uniqueness and we have to figure out what works and roll with it, right? <laughs> if you are a um, teacher, I know as we prepare for the upcoming school year, just had to throw this little bitty plug in there and you're in need of more professional development, please, please, please reach out to me, get your administrators, tell them, send them my channel. I actually have a... Um, a whole letter you can send them. Just simply email me at pd at everythingaja.com. And there's also my website. I do do professional developments in schools as well as working with parents individually. So I would love, love, love to connect with you even further. So there's my information. Make sure you write it down, take a screenshot, whatever you need to do. But I would love to connect with you even further. So, um, Oh, I thought she said something in the chat box. I'm looking like, whoo. I also want to know, we talked about books and we talked about today um, being the celebration of Juneteenth. I do want you to know last Juneteenth, I went ahead and celebrated the holiday as well by giving you 25 African-American books for children. So if you are in need of some good books or you want to find books that really highlight the culture and gets children excited about who they are and what they look like, then definitely check out that video. I go over 25 books. I give you a little brief um, brief summary of each and every book. The link to that is down below in the description. And in order to celebrate Juneteenth, what, what more could we do for our children than to simply read them some books that highlight and celebrate their culture? So the link to that video is also down below in the comment. And I also will link it right after um after this video you'll see the link on it as well so y'all let me know what is your favorite african american book i know um I had two as a child, but mine one one of mine as a child was designed by God, so I must be special. I used to read that book all the time, and it was one of my first books that had African American children on the front cover. And we got it from Martin Luther King Center. At that time, I lived in Indiana, maybe not. 
I don't know, but I was young. But we visited Atlanta and we came to the Dr. Martin Luther King Center and I saw the book and I was like, oh, I want that book. And my mom bought it and it became one of my favorite books. That and what was that other book? She was like a ballerina, Amazing Grace, Amazing Grace. I'm like, she was a ballerina. That was my other favorite book of just inspiring me um, to be who I was. And now there are tons of books. Um, my brother was just showing me that Gabrielle Union just released a book with her and her daughter. So definitely, if you are a parent, celebrate this weekend, celebrate Juneteenth by reading some good African-American books to your children. Um, and remember these five tips. Once again, make reading active. Don't put them in a box. Allow them to do what they do, you know? <laughs> Allow them to just kind of get up and, and, and move. Um, and then also, um, sorry, close in the gaps. Remember that if a child has a reading deficit, you want to start off first with phonics, figure out that, and then teach them strategies. It's okay to not know something. You just use what you know in order to fill in what you don't know. Um, and then the third tip was to have a print-rich environment. Go ahead, think about what is on your walls. What kind of words do they see around them in their environment? You want to have like posters and, you know, words on things. I actually have at-home labels that I sell for a dollar. I think they're a dollar. They're only a dollar. But I all around my house, I have at home labels like on my stove or my microwave so as you guys like look at a lot of my videos or like my vlogs you'll see I have signs I've signed the word that says door on the door and um, as my daughter learns how to read and learns words as she walks around her house she sees words everywhere um, and I started I, I knew I wanted to do that because being a teacher teaching pre-k for so long when we taught when I taught pre-k I had the signs all around my classroom so I was like when I become a parent I'm gonna do that too and it really does help it really does matter in having a print rich environment um, and then also collect the library of books that we talked about have a library of books teach skills early don't what are we waiting on stop waiting go ahead you have the power you have my permission to start teaching them as early as possible because they're 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 faced up against unfortunately african american children are are up against a system that's like almost designed to keep them behind. And as we see that while 71% of African-American children are reading below grade level, but only 31% of white children are reading below grade level, there is a deficit, there is a gap, and it is every single one of our job, our duty to help close that gap. You say you're so excited, you can't wait for the workshop. Woo -woo. Hopefully, uh, not hopefully, I know. I was about to say, hopefully you'll be able to apply them with your children and your um, your child. But I know, I'm not even going to say hopefully. I don't know why, I just, girl. I know that you are going to receive amazing value in the workshop that will help you both as a teacher and as a as a parent. So that is awesome. I can't wait to see you there. Woo -woo. Um, and then also tip number five that brought us to tip number five, which was become the expert. So the link to the workshop is in the comments. I cannot wait to see you there as I give you three secrets to teaching reading with ease so that you can really dive into closing this gap. I hope you have a wonderful Juneteenth celebration. A lot of y'all are off work on Monday. Let me know who's off work on Monday. But as you celebrate Juneteenth, remember that it is your job and it is your duty to help close the gap with these African American children. Thank y'all. See you. Um, see you next week. I am changing up real quick. I am changing up my upload schedule. So there'll be um, two videos I'm releasing every single week. So it, it has varied just a little bit, but um, the, the new schedule will be posted on the community tab. So make sure you have your notifications turned on. That's the little bell right next to the subscription um, button so that you can receive notifications each and every time I go live or upload a new video. Don't forget, if you are ready to close these gaps, then hit the big thumbs up button. That button is right here. Hit the big like, like thumbs up button to like this video. I'm so excited that you are willing and able to close in this gap. And I will see you in the next video. Don't forget to watch 25 good books for African-American children.